Dear colleagues and guests, it is my great honor to welcome you all on behalf of the National Assembly of Republic of Serbia. I am very glad to welcome our distinguished guest, President of European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, Mr. Suma Chakrabarti. Our ministers in government of Republic of Serbia, Vice President of the Parliament, Mr. Arsic, MPs from the Parliament of Republic of Serbia, Excellencies, ambassadors, representatives of enterprises, business associations, media, and our dear colleagues and partners from NALED and uh, European Movement in Serbia. At the very beginning, let me remind you all the economy, economy development is primary task of every government, and strong economy guarantees the well-being of people, stability and prosperity of the whole society. Market and democratic reforms go hand in hand together. The crucial strategic aim of Republic of Serbia is to become fully integrated member of the European Union. Such membership will make us work harder to achieve the level of development of its members and to achieve better living standards. We have many partners of our path, supporting us and sharing our vision on modern and developed society. EBRD has been supporting the process of economy reforms in Serbia for years, but the process is still not at its end. For instance, EBRD is enhancing the competitiveness of the private sector through support of small and medium enterprises, supporting restructuring public enterprises like electric power industry to improve com commercial standing, supporting major infrastructure projects of the state and local self-governments supporting banks, supporting renewable and sustainable energy development. So far, experience from the previous period shows that some 80% of the projects achieved their aimed impact. Many reforms are pending and waiting to be finished in the next period. Reforms in the public administration, reforms in energy sector, competition policy, creating new jobs. The strength and the will to go through harsh reforms are the distinctive feature on the previous and this new government led by our Prime Minister, Mr. Aleksandar Vucic. I do hope EBRD will recognize the efforts and capabilities of the government to make desired transition to the fully market economy and will continue to support efforts towards a stable business environment. There are many indicators for this, like the better ranking of Serbia on doing business list. Let me mention just this one. We do know that National Assembly and the government will have to join their efforts and create encouraging global regulations for the private sector, industry, and the structure of public enterprises. I will mention that very important role of National Alliance for Local and Economy Development, organization which uh, always force the state institution, government, and parliament to make especially public administration, much more effectiveness and efficient. We do hope that our joint activities will lead us through the harmonization with European legislation and to eventually close the negotiation chapters in 2019. Personally, I believe that growth and expansion of the quantitative small and medium enterprises will affect and bring further development of economy in the country. Less regulations and taxes should make it easier for them to work. The results should be fertile soil for the future investments and new jobs. In order to reach our long-term goals, we need partners and supportive mechanisms. That is why we have this unique opportunity to hear Mr. Suma Chakrabarti, President of European Bank of Reconstruction and Development here in Belgrade. I would like to invite Mr. Chakrabarti to take the floor and give us the, his view on economy reforms and economy development and role of EBRD uh, in that process in Republican Serbia. Mr. Chakrabarti, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much indeed for your kind words of introduction, uh, Professor Marinkovic. Uh, good evening, everyone, ministers, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, 
friends, new acquaintances. I have to say it's a real pleasure for me to be back here in Belgrade. Uh, this is actually my fourth visit to Serbia as EBRD president. I think some of my staff think I'm a bit biased in favor of the Western Balkans, in favor of Serbia, and I make no apology for that. I think this, uh, this wonderful region and this country deserve our support in full measure. So it's great to be back, and it's great to be back for the first time in my case in this wonderful building. I've never been here despite my many visits to Serbia. So thank you very much. And I, let me start also by thanking Naled and the European Movement for Serbia who've helped to organize this event. These are two organizations which have consistently supported Serbia's European vision, and I'm very, very glad to have met their directors just now here in person. Indeed, it's actually a real honor to be invited to speak here and to be able to share our thoughts on such an important topic. My subject this evening is integration, Europe and the EBRD. Now, I'm going to be arguing that internationalism, the notion that nation states should aspire to deeper cooperation for the greater good of all is not the spent force that many of us would have you believe. It's actually a really, really live topic. I'm going to be arguing that economic integration is one of the most effective vehicles for advancing its cause, that it's a powerful force for promoting efficient markets and reforms. And as such, economic integration is one of the EBRD's strategic priorities, one that defines uh, what we do across our regions. Wherever we work, we encourage integration within those regions and between them and with global markets. Now, here in Europe, I'm going to be arguing that cause, that cause of integration has been very, very well served by the European Union and its values. Now, we, we at the EBRD are proud to be the EU's partner in this endeavor. It's also fitting, I think, that I should be delivering this speech here in Belgrade, in the National Assembly building, because Serbia has committed itself to a European path, and we're doing everything at the EBRD in our power to help speed that journey. We salute the role both Parliament and the government here have played in steering the country in that European direction. Now, accompanying countries such as Serbia along the long road towards integration has been one of the major themes of our work ever since the EBRD was founded. Now, we're almost at the end of summer. Autumn is almost with us. But I think we're still allowed to celebrate the EBRD's 25th birthday, which actually fell back in uh, April. The EBRD, just to remind you, was established 25 years ago to develop open and sustainable market economies in countries committed to and applying democratic principles. And our founders, they were very, very explicit in commending the importance of close and coordinated cooperation to help economies become more internationally competitive. The EBRD, when it was created, it was actually envisaged to be a multilateral financial institution of a new kind. They insisted on that. It would act as a unique structure of cooperation in Europe, they said. And as such, true to those internationalist and multilateralist principles, in the last quarter of a century, we've invested more than 105 billion euros in thousands of projects, most of them in the private sector. In Europe, of course, but also now in Asia, and more recently in what we call the Southern and Eastern Mediterranean. Now, over those 25 years, we've seen the role of the private sector enhanced, entrepreneurship encouraged, market competition boosted, and emerging economies much more integrated into global supply chains. Given the circumstances of our, of our birth, soon after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we are, of course, a child of the end of the Cold War. The values that inspired the creation of the EBRD were very much of their time. Our purpose was defined as fostering transition, transition towards open market-oriented economies. But those values they were not actually born in those head years that witnessed the collapse of communism in our continent. Actually, the heritage of EBRD and the principles we believe in, the market principles, integration, those stretch much further back into history. Economic integration was actually one of the values that inspired the miraculous rebuilding of Western Europe after the destruction wrought by the Second World War and, one might add, the Great Depression of the 1930s. Indeed, for me, I think, 
one has to go back to the 19th century to see the origins of those values. Free trade, what is it? Asked the 19th century English liberal Richard Cobden. He actually answered his own question by saying, why? Breaking down the barriers that separate nations, those barriers behind which nestle the feelings of pride, of revenge, hatred, and jealousy, which every now and then burst their bounds and deluge whole countries with blood. And the importance of opening markets up to greater competition was also, of course, acknowledged by that son of the Scottish Enlightenment, Adam Smith. Monopoly, he said. Monopoly, besides, is a great enemy to good management, he argued, in The Wealth of Nations, as long as, oh, as 1776. For good management, he said, can never be universally established, but in consequence of that free and universal competition which forces everybody to have recourse to it for the sake of self-defense. So, so much for the intellectual architecture of the world of 25 years ago and the world we live in today. We are, of course, pragmatists. We recognize that the march of history is uneven. Its tempo, of course, varies. History has its up and downs. It zigs and zags. But let's not forget, I think, the huge strides that much of Europe has made in the course of a single generation. Let's look now at some of the countries that the EBRD was originally set up to help which are now members of the European Union. Let's look at Central and Eastern Europe and the Baltics. Their transformation, I believe, of the last quarter of a century has been so extraordinary that I think we're at danger of taking it for granted. That transformation has been so wide-ranging that it's difficult to know quite where to begin in summing it up. But we see how these countries, those very countries, are now so integrated into global value chains, how much more competitive they've become, how quickly they've adopted modern technologies. Exports have increased dramatically, both as a share of GDP and as a percentage of global trade from those countries. Income levels are converging with those of the rest of the European Union, although of course there's a long way to go before we can still talk about parity. Now those changes didn't happen overnight. Accession to the European Union for many of those countries took somewhere between 8 to 12 years, but it was time very well spent. Democratic values, democratic institutions, those were reinforced during that accession process. Countries could prepare for the challenge of membership of a cohesive grouping of nation states with common political and economic interests. They could get themselves ready for entry to a much bigger market than before, one which brought many, many more opportunities, but also, of course, much fiercer competition. And throughout that period, the European Union and its values provided a vital anchor point and a strong incentive for reform. The EU, I think, was in no small way midwife to the historic changes we've witnessed in those countries. Indeed, while I'm not a great believer in counterfactual history, I do think we can say one, th one thing for sure. Without the European Union, and if the EU didn't exist or embraced some other values than those that I mentioned earlier, I think the recent history of those nations, of Central Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, and the Baltics, the recent story would have actually looked very different indeed. Now, I think the EU is performing a similar role here in Serbia and the Western Balkans. Of course, we'd have all liked the EU to have played that role much, much earlier, but there was instability, there was conflict in the 1990s which prevented the start of that process. But today, here too, approximation with the EU, I believe, is now the most powerful external anchor for reforms. But here, quite rightly, I think, it comes together with a focus on regional cooperation. Regional cooperation is an excellent precondition for aspirant countries as they work towards EU approximation. Both are key pillars of stability in their own right. Both are indispensable to the region's economic prospects. I think this region, I really do believe this, I think this region knows better than most how important cooperation is as an investment for the future. Together with our EU partners, we at the EBRD have been particularly active in encouraging cross-border cooperation here. The 2014 summit at our headquarters in London effectively launched the Western Balkans 6 process at the level of Prime Ministers. Today, it's now called the Berlin process, that's a tangible reality. It sends a very, very strong message to the rest of the world, the message that the region has attained new heights of maturity and stability. 
And such intensifying cooperation, I think, is one of the region's greatest achievements of recent times. And of course, you know this better than I do, that, that cooperation is especially important given the memories of the past. Progress and coordination better between the Western Balkans countries has been matched by better cooperation with and between international donors, the European Commission, and international financial institutions such as the EBRD. The result of all of that is a visible strengthening in the way we pool resources in support of regional projects, first of all through the Western Balkans investment framework. Under the leadership of the European Commission, much better coordination has allowed a number of significant regional transport and energy projects to be prioritized. Among those we at the EBRD are seeking to support is one that Prime Minister Vucic has called the Peace Highway, connecting Nish with Duras via Pristina. And overall, we have now provided a total of 2.8 billion euros for regional infrastructure projects that are worth as a total of 7.5 billion euros. Just a few weeks ago in Montenegro, I visited a little publicized but vital system, the Southeastern Europe Coordinated Auction Office. I didn't know anything about this office, but I went because I was intrigued. It allocates scarce electricity transmission capacity across the region by a single fair auction process. I think such cooperation would have been unimaginable two decades ago. Other initiatives go beyond the big physical infrastructure to connect markets in other ways. At our latest Western Balkans Investment Summit this February, we at the EBRD launched the Southeast Europe Link, SEE Link. This is an innovative regional platform integrating the stock exchanges of Southeastern Europe. Now this system became operational this summer. It's already boosting liquidity, improving access for investors and brokers across the region. I'd also like to mention here the soon to be launched Western Balkans Business Registries port Portal, which will connect all the ancient registries of the region, starting firstly with Serbia and FYR Macedonia. Several other countries have expressed an interest in joining that as well in the coming months. Some small examples along with the big infrastructure projects of what's happening in the region that people don't know enough about, the cooperation, the integration that's going on. Now, ladies and gentlemen, at the uh, February summit in London, I remarked on the way such cooperation is, I think, a testament to the vision of this region's leaders. And yet, in the wider Europe and beyond, as you know, the cause of internationalism and the arguments in favor of economic integration are being challenged. Certainly, I think in my own lifetime, I can't remember anything like the skepticism about these values that we see today. Indeed, I feel sometimes that the main ideological battle of our times is no longer between left and right, but between those who believe in open societies and those who believe in closed societies. Now, we don't expect everyone to agree with us. We'd, of course, like that, but we don't expect it. But the EBID perspective on the world we live in is very clear. The list of challenges that our regions face is long, and there are voices out there suggesting that globalization is making them worse, or even that globalization or integration is actually a cause of some of those challenges. Now, those voices that are out there advocate a pause in the momentum for greater integration. Some even argue, of course, we're rolling it back. We at the EBRD, we disagree with that. For many of these challenges, we regard deeper economic integration as a key part of the solution, not the problem. Either that, or integration is simply irrelevant to the issues at hand, whatever those arguing against globalization might think. So what are those challenges that we face, the ones that really matter? Well, in our view, they include the negative, negative effect of sluggish or non-existent growth in the EBRD regions as they emerge still from the financial crisis of the last decade. Now, we understand the reasons for the shortfalls in investment that make re-energizing that growth such a challenge. And we're doing everything we can with our partners to try and remedy those that problem. We're tackling corruption that dogs some of our countries and improving the investment climate where we can. We recognize the threat to our societies posed by rising inequality. And we're doing our best to promote gender equality and inclusion in general as part of our commitment to sustainable and environmentally sound development. We are on the ground here in Serbia, throughout the region, in all our countries of operation helping them deal with an influx of millions of refugees. 
and we are pioneers of a private sector approach to growing the green economy and combating climate change. We do not believe that going it alone is the answer. Such a response to global problems that we face, and they really are global in scope and nature, such a response would be a betrayal, and not just of the internationalist values that are at the heart of the EBRD's mandate. We believe that it would betray the hopes and aspirations of the millions of people in our regions who want a better life for themselves and their children, and who realize that the world, the world that we live in is interconnected as never before. And yes, I am, I am making the case for more and closer integration. Yes, and I am a British president of a multilateral financial institution based in the city of London. So it may seem somewhat surprising, but I truly believe in this, as do many of my compatriots, and as we do in the EBRD. Whatever the United Kingdom's future status vis-a-vis -vis the European Union, I know that its traditions of free trade, openness, and engagement with the rest of the world run very, very deep. It was no accident when I looked at these values, historical origins, that I cited the founding fathers as an Englishman, Richard Cobden, and a Scotsman, Adam Smith. Now before I sum up, I'd like to just dwell for a few moments in more detail on the EBRD's understanding of integration and what, what it can do for our world. How it can further the values of internationalism that are at the heart of what we do. How, they, how it can help us in our mission to invest in changing lives. Integration is absolutely central to our performance as a bank. In fact, I would say that along with boosting the economic resilience of our countries of operation and addressing global challenges such as climate change, promoting economic integration is one of our three strategic priorities. We see economic integration as a powerful force promoting efficient markets and reform. It increases competition in product markets. It widens the range of financing sources available for investment. It allows countries to opt into institutional arrangements of a higher standard. And it imposes very, very strict discipline on governance, legal, regulatory, and other institutions. So openness to international markets and integration with them also, I believe, spurs innovation with businesses and economies as a whole. And for our part at the EBRD, we support open markets and integration through cross-border financial flows and investment, trade finance, infrastructure, improved skills and standards in SMEs, policy dialogue, and partnerships with institutional investors. It's a very, very broad spectrum of activity. So integration goes to the heart of what the EBRD is about. As far as investment integration is concerned, we can work with governments, to increase volumes of foreign direct investment, which lag behind those flowing into other emerging markets. We've really got to help them redouble their efforts. Governments in this region redouble their efforts to strengthen the investment climate. We're already working on that. And I've mentioned the Western Balkans investment framework. Its work is really quite noteworthy. The Western Balkans investment framework is really helping to coordinate beneficiary governments, the European Commission, the international financial institutions in preparing and implementing infrastructure projects that support connectivity in the region. I think it's been exemplary. Such initiatives, I think, can do a lot to address the legacy of substandard infrastructure, which undermines integration, undermines inclusion and growth across the EBRD regions. So I'd also note the way that we're assisting countries to diversify their energy sources, in particular through better integration, again, better integration of regional energy markets. And while integration needs to work within regions, integration with global markets is also important, particularly if we're going to attract more capital from pension and sovereign wealth funds from around the world into our region. Now I've touched on Serbia and its European path in the context of the Western Balkans. I, I believe that what the EBID has done here should be seen, should be seen as an eloquent ad advertisement of the benefits of working together and for the wider cause of reform and regional cooperation. We've invested over 4 billion euros here in Serbia in more than 200 projects over the years. I think it's very telling that this city, the city of Belgrade, is in fact our largest municipal client across all of our countries of operation. As I look around your capital, I can see the evidence of how much we've achieved together. 
Our work with the Serbian authorities in partnership with donors and other multilateral development banks is having real, real impact. We just signed recently a 200 million euro loan to support comprehensive reforms at EPS in the power sector last year. We also are helping private companies, both large and small. Last year, we supported the, the largest mergers and acquisition transaction in the region when Mid-Europa Mid Partners purchased the Moi Brendovi uh, conglomerate. We also made our first loan here as part of our Women in Business financing for micro and small borrowers. And I am enormously proud of that, by the way. I think one of the things we've got to do in Serbia and the Western Balkans is get more female entrepreneurs to the marketplace by getting them access to finance. But our engagement with Serbia is about more than just financials. We enhance the role and competitiveness of the private sector with a special focus on SMEs that suffer from limited access to financing. When we take an equity share in companies, as we've done in many times here in Serbia, we also review and improve their corporate governance. We support institution building, of course, through our investment climate and governance initiative. And here I would note the importance of our work with the Serbian parliament as we advise on legal and regulatory reforms. We need to do more work with the parliament here going forward. Of course, there's much more which Serbia needs to do to create a truly competitive business environment, reducing corruption, improving the judiciary, streamlining bureaucracy, reducing the role of the state. But crucially, all of these steps that we're working on together will, equ will equip your country for its future in the wider European and global markets. I think taken together, these different activity streams are going to help deliver all, all of our three strategic priorities. Integration, economic resilience, and of course an enhanced ability for Serbia to address global and regional challenges that occur here. And enhance those qualities, I believe, which potentially make Serbia and its neighbors so attractive to future investors. Not least the prospect of an even closer relationship with the European Union. Something that other emerging markets just do not have and which promotes market-oriented reforms and European Union standards. But also, you have the attractiveness of a region that has strong macroeconomic stability with Serbia leading the way, a strategic location, diverse economies, favorable tax regimes, and well-educated population. You have yourselves, really. You are the best attraction to foreign investors. So, ladies and gentlemen, internationalism, globalism, economic integration, cooperation, tolerance, connectivity, call it what you will, these are some of the values that inspired the creation of the EBRD 25 years ago. They've been, in my view, instrumental in delivering historic changes across our region in the quarter of a century since. I think the European Union has been one of our most effective and resolute partners over that same period. Now, that's true, I think, both of the broader EBRD regions, but here in the Western Balkans, in the form of the Western Balkans framework and the instrument for pre-accession assistance. And it's my firm belief that it's in the EU's own strategic interests to pursue further integration with the Western Balkans. I think there's a clear understanding of this in Brussels and in other EU capitals. And we're very, very glad to see the continuing support for EU membership in Serbia. I referred to the march of history earlier, how uneven it can be. I know that this has sometimes been true of popular support here for the EU. For the EU. But I tell you, I think experience shows that support increases whenever citizens realize that the way is open for their country to progress to the next phase of EU integration. And our commitment to the internationalist values of economic integration and regional cooperation, it doesn't rest on dogma. We've always been pragmatic at the EBRD, always flexible, always adaptable. We judge our performance by results, not by the way they correspond to theory. But like the EBRD itself, the values that lie at the heart of our business are, I can assure you, in rude health. Our success is also the success of our countries of operations, countries like Serbia. Our mission certainly isn't accomplished here or in the region. There's a lot of work still to do, but further integration can do a lot of that work for us, and it can help build a better Europe. A Europe, I feel, in which Serbia and the Western Balkans as a whole can really secure their rightful place. I look forward to that day. Thank you very much.
Mr. Chakrabarti, thank you very much indeed for your great speech today. We are very proud in National Assembly of Republic of Serbia to be host of your presentation. Uh, your presentation today and especially we have a new inspiration from your speech uh, not only in Serbia that in all Western Balkan countries and thank you for that for your commitment and commitment of EBRD uh, to our region and uh, our countries to be more developed and to uh, be uh, modern and stronger countries but uh, we will be committed in uh, development of all of region to regional reconciliation and especially economic cooperation and thank you very much indeed for your uh, support in that uh, in that theme. Uh, we have uh, some very very short uh, question time and uh, if someone have some question be open to to ask uh, President of EBRD, Mr. Chakrabarti. Oh, floor is yours. Okay, please, Director of the... Zvonko Bradovic, Director of the Serbian Business Register Agency. I would like to express a warm gratitude to the EBRD. Uh, we are actually responsible institutions for the Western Balkan Future Portal. We initiated this project with the, the neighboring countries here and I would like to thank to your team both in London and both in Belgrade for recognizing this opportunity. We had uh, with, the, with EBRD the presentation in May on the uh, uh, international conference in front of the 80 countries and we have now Macedonia and Serbia initially but Slovenia, Romania and it's a very very long list of the country which are actually interested and uh, Following this expression of gratitude, I hope that we will have a, a very important result and we will send, I'm quite sure, a strong message since that about the data collected from the registries from the region, we have among 25,000 of companies we are, which are interfere in the region and invest in the region and I hope this number will actually increase and this is, I hope, a good tool for our companies and our entrepreneurs. Thank you very much. It, is, it was not the question, but it is the expression of the gratitude. Sorry for this interrupting. Okay. Well, I mean, just to, I mean, it wasn't a question, but I think it's a very important point uh, you made. I think um, this is one great example of what is happening on the ground that I believe is just not very well known outside the region. I think people in the region are beginning to know these things and very positive about them people in EBRD who are specialists on the region, of course they know about it. But one of the problems I feel that we have uh, for those of us who care about this region is often uh, attracting those who don't know much about the region and live really with images of the past, of the conflict and uh, the division, if you like. They don't know that these examples, small, big, are all happening. And I feel a duty, obviously, for EBRD, but also working with the leadership uh, here in the Western Balkans, generally to advertise this much more. And we're trying through our investment summits, we've had two major summits now in London, where we bring not just the existing investors who know the region, but the new ones who don't know the region, and try and give these examples. Uh, that's why I was very proud of the SEE link that I mentioned, because I didn't know about it, actually, until the day of the, the conference and summit. And for me, it was a powerful uh, statement of what is happening organically in the region and how we should be supporting it and how we should advertise it to new investors to show that the region has changed. There's a new generation of leaders who are trying to do things in a very different way. Thank you, President Chagrabarti. We have more questions. Please, just introduce yourself, please. Hello, <clears throat> Maris Tabetsis from the Australian Embassy. Um, I was quite interested in the, your work on women in business um, here and in, in the region, and um, interested in, in what you think are some opportunities, not just in access to finance, but in some other barriers for women in business in the region. 
So, I mean, uh, short of giving a long list of the barriers, I think what I can direct you to is the EBRD's gender strategy, which was approved by our shareholders last uh, December. And I think this is interesting uh, for those of us who worked in the development business. I mean, my friend here, Dusan uh, Vujovic, who, of course, had worked at the World Bank and other places, for people like him and me, it was almost a no-brainer, no really, to think of these issues as economic issues, not just as social inclusion issues, but as economic issues. There's a large segment of the market who's excluded, either from the labor market or the financial market, and included. And when I arrived at the EBID, I thought it would be a no-brainer, actually, for um, our shareholders. It wasn't, actually. It, the, the economics had moved on, and inequality and inclusion issues, or economic issues as much as social issues, wasn't. And it took me and my colleagues three and a half years to get this accepted in the bank. We started small. We started with some excellent programs that our bankers put together in Turkey, where there was a, a classic problem of uh, actually access to finance for female entrepreneurs, locked out because the banking market wanted collateral uh, in property. That's how the banking market worked there, and properties in the man's name too often and so therefore we, women were locked out of the of the market now the bankers in turkey they noticed this huge segment of the population that was underserved where they could make some profit as well as do some good uh, and they worked with us and we rolled out a women in business program there that was focused essentially on that and that's been such a success that i think we're now in 16 or 20 countries where we're doing similar things and, and certainly in the balkans that's also happening too um, but it's more than that. There are other countries, as, as you'd see when you see our strategy, uh, where the actual employment law prevents women from going to certain professions. These are former communist countries, so the expectation would have been that actually, under communism, those things would not have been there, but they were there in law, and they've been kept on post-communism as well. So there are some legal changes where we need to work with parliaments and others, with the ILO, to try and get those sort of things uh, sorted, because these are economic issues as much as social issues, I think. So there's a whole range of uh, things that we need to work on uh, to do this. Thank you. We don't have any question. I will to close the uh, this. Huh. Minister Vujovic, please. I'm very sorry yeah. I didn't saw you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this great opportunity to, to uh, actually uh, give us a, a chance to hear firsthand what your current thinking is on the role of DBRD. I have two small questions. One is, if you could echo for our public, recently you sent us all, all the governors of EBRD, a letter reflecting on your challenges that you see regarding Brexit. If you could summarize for our audience uh, some of these challenges as you see them. And the second one is, as EBRD is now getting to be more than 25, uh, the, the initial mandate of EBRD has evolved over time. And EBRD is now becoming closer and closer involved with, with equity financing, where its role is, is considerably different from being a, a regular bank on the one hand, and the other hand, the balancing between the public sector support and the private sector support. How do you see these balances uh, going forward? Thank you very much, Dusan. I think um, on the challenges post-Brexit, I think these are still to be played out. I mean, in terms of our, our analysis of our region and the impact on the economies here, for example, I don't think we'll know the full impact of this until much later, in two to three years' time. The immediate impact in, on the British economy has been much more around, around the currency market rather than anything else. Uh, but I am concerned because I think symbolically, as I was trying to say in my speech, what this indicates is that there are some people who would like to say, stop the world, I want to get off, and uh, I don't want to be integrated in the same way as before. But their long-term economic health depends on integration, really. The world has changed from 25, 30 years ago, and it's much more integrated. And I applaud, frankly, what you have been doing here in Serbia I think you've led the way in much of Eastern Europe in terms of getting investment from around the world. So when, I, when I, we, my banker colleagues and I in, within the EBRD said to our shareholders, we can't simply just market our region to Western European companies and North American companies. We have to go to Asia. We have to go to the Gulf. The example I used to give was actually you started that here in Serbia. You know, you've got Etihad to come here. You, you know, you've been really encouraging investment from a wider set of countries. Uh, and I think that is one answer to the post-Brexit 
problems, actually, is that we have to widen the portfolio of those who are integrating themselves into our region. The second thing, I think you're right, the mandate, the, base, the basic core of the mandate hasn't changed, the market economy principle, but we've learned a lot more. So back in 1991, uh, we wouldn't have thought about the gender issues um, as part of the economic marketplace, if you like. So we've been able to now include things as, a, as part of the market concept, really, that we wouldn't have had then. We've also, I think, learned that transition requires more than just uh, move, you know, supporting the private sector. We've learned that policies really matter, working with governments on getting the right policies to attract investors, get the investment climate right, better governance really matters in that respect, fighting corruption. All these things that we would have paid much less attention to 25 years ago. So in fact, uh, as, as you may know, I think um, in the next six months, uh, a revised transition concept will emerge from the EBRD, which our chief economist has been working on. And it will emphasize things like competitiveness. We really need to care much more about the competitiveness of uh, companies. That really matters, by the way, particularly in countries like the Western Balkans, countries like Serbia, because as you enter the EU, one of the first issues is going to be how competitive are your companies against existing EU uh, companies. And we have to help raise the standards so that you are competitive. Uh, I think the question around how well governed are companies and governments that's going to matter a lot. So governance at both company level and at uh, government level is going to matter a lot. I think sustainability is going to matter a lot. The environment, energy efficiency agenda is becoming a much bigger agenda for EBRD than 25 years ago. We are now seen as the leaders in the private sector of energy efficiency investment uh, around our countries. I think that's great. I think we, we will now increase the amount we do in that area. So this is just three or four examples of how I think the mandate is being redefined for the modern world. And I think that's the right thing to do. Um, one of our uh, directors on the EBRD put it really wonderfully when, when there was a bit of a debate going on in the board um, between those who think this is you know, moving away from the, the original the core of the mandate. He said we should stop wallowing in nostalgia and accept the world has changed and therefore the concept of transition, what it is to be a market economy is changing and we have to adapt. And I think he's right. Okay, thank you. One more question? Professor Juricin. Uh, Mr. President, are there any hidden lines, fractures, open issues between ECB and EBRD? And if this exists, uh, how can influence the relationship with Serbia in financing some projects? QE is maybe so the actually, on the list. Yeah, actually we have a very strong relationship with the ECB, not just at my level, but I think uh, throughout our two organizations. So I have been on record as uh, being very supportive of the QE uh, push by the ECB because I, I think we have to try every instrument we can to uh, encourage growth in our region. I think the ECB and, and EBRD, we're both worried about the lack of growth that many of our countries of operation are operating at growth levels below their potential. Now again, here, interestingly, the Western Balkans has rebounded very well in the last two or three years, actually, uh, both uh, certainly in Serbia and also in some of the other countries. But why am I holding, why have I asked um, for a EU13 uh, conference in Budapest in November it's on growth, and I'm worried that the EU13 members, countries of operation of DBRD, are all growing too slowly compared with their potential. And if they don't grow fast enough, then uh, there are economic consequences, of course, but there, I think there are social and political consequences in terms of youth unemployment and other issues like that. And the ECB has been incredibly supportive of that push. It, they see it as really very uh, synergetic to what they've been trying to do. So I think we're in the same space very much. Okay, thank you. Just before I invited you in uh, parliamentary hall on uh, cocktail, I would like to thank you to President Ch Chakrabarti for encouraging us here in Serbia, but uh, all us in the region, to strengthening our SMP sector, to improve our business environment and public administration, and as soon as possible to build highway of peace 
and uh, common stock exchange in the region of uh, Western Balkans. Thank you very much indeed for uh, uh, our partners co-organizing uh, of this event, especially uh, EBRD, NALED, and the European Movement in, uh, in Serbia. And President Chakrabarti, we are expecting you as soon as possible here in Parliament of Republic of Serbia and hope to cooperate uh, very well in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.